Hello and welcome to this presentation on LGC's latest venture into the world of ultra-sensitive biomarker detection. My name is Dan Creed and I work as a senior scientist here in the LMB department in Fordham. And over the next 20 minutes or so, I'll be talking about and sharing some data on our latest investment into this area. Now, this is just a, a simple diagram to show what we are currently seeing in this market and what we need to be seeing in this market. It's important to point out at this point that we're not a diagnostic preventative healthcare company. We're a CRO, of course, but we must, we must recognize the need for early detection of disease, particularly in the neuro and cancer markets, because just like the pharma companies, patients are at the forefront of what we are doing. With emerging technology that can reliably detect biomarker concentrations at the sub picogram peptogram levels, we are making huge strides in this market. So, in 2019, LGC completed the initial evaluation to replace the existing Arena Singulex system. I won't go into too much details here of exactly what we did and what we tested as I presented on this at the 2019 Biomarker Conference in Manchester. But just to give a brief summary of what was done, we looked at um, four systems, the Quanterix HD1, HDX, in which an external lab visit was completed for demonstration and testing. Um, another offering by Quanterix, the SRX. This was uh, tested in-house at LGC on a demo instrument. Um, Merck's direct replacement to the SMCX Pro. This again was tested in-house at LGC. And we did intend on testing MSD's latest offering, the SPLEX. Uh, unfortunately, this was not available for in-house testing at the time of evaluation, so we couldn't really do too much in this area. And this was the conclusion of this testing. So as of 2019, October, uh, LGC became the first CRO in Europe to have a Quanterix HDX installed inside their laboratories. The HDX is a floor standing, fully automated, integrated assay prep to detection system. Analysts were basic and homebrew trained by Quanterix themselves. Um, there is a range of commercial off-the-shelf biomarker kits available, as well as the option to homebrew your own method developments. The system can also multiplex up to sixplex, which is one of the improvements to its predecessor, the HD1, which I'll talk about in more detail in a couple of slides time. And we are pleased to say that the CSV testing is now completed as of April on this instrument, meaning we are in full regulated work for PK and PD biomarker assays. A HDX runs off Samoa technology or single molecule array and this slide just gives an overview of how this happens. HDX methods can be run in a one-step, a two-step or a three-step fashion. This diagram shows the overview of a three-step assay. In a three-step assay, target antibody coated paramagnetic beads are combined and incubated with the sample alone. Target molecules present in the sample are captured by the antibody coated beads. After washing, biotinylated detector antibodies are mixed and incubated with the beads again. The detector antibodies bind to the captured target during this additional incubation period. After an additional wash, a conjugate of Streptavidin beta galactosidase, or SBG for short, is mixed with the beads. This SPG binds to the biotinylated detector antibodies, resulting in the enzyme labeling of the captured target. Following one final wash, the beads are resuspended in a RGP substrate or resorufin beta D galactopyranocide. This is transferred then to the Samoa disk. Each disk contains 24 arrays, and each array contains around 240,000 wells, each well big enough for one bead. And this is where the single molecule detection comes into play. If the target has been captured and labeled on the bead, the enzyme, subs the enzyme conjugate, sorry, the SPG hydrolyzes the RGB substrate in the microwells into a fluorescent product that then provides the signal for measurement. And again, as this is single molecule counting, only one single labeled target molecule re will result in sufficient fluorescent signal to be detected and counted by the Samoa system. At low target concentrations, the percentage of bead containing wells in the array that have a positive signal is directly proportional to the amount of target present in that sample. 
at higher target concentrations, when most of the bee containing worlds have one or more labeled target molecules, the total fluorescence signal is proportional to the amount of target present in that sample. Now you'll notice on the bottom right of this uh, diagram that it shows the ways that the beads are loaded onto each disc and are sealed with oil. Now this is something that's changed quite quite drastically since the predecessor of the HD1 and I'll go into that further in, in the next slide or two. This is just the HDX system layout. I won't spend too much time on this slide, but to give a general overview, this is what the instrument looks like. The user control interface, very simple to use, multi-touch monitor, the input bays for both the reagents and the samples and the consumables are in the middle sections. And then we now have drawers on the bottom. The predecessor of the HD1 had open doors, had an open door system. To give an internal view on this, so the reagent bay, which is this one here, this is now temperature cooled to two to eight degrees for reagent stability. Uh, all reactions take place inside the washer incubator ring. Samples and uh, RGP substrate go in this section here, which relates to here. And the, and the SMO disk and tip storage or the consumables go in this far right hand corner here. Everything on this system has really been designed for ease of use. Uh, everything contains a sort of a click click reaction mechanism if you like. All reagents, samples, tips, discs, etc. you name it, can be loaded in just a matter of seconds. And as I mentioned earlier, the HDX includes a series of design changes and updates to the predecessor of the HD1. This, this involves both hardware and software changes to improve the reliability, ease of use and robustness. Below in the table, there are some of the HDX features that are new. And beside them with the green ticks are the ones that were of particular importance and interest to us. Firstly, the LED light source. This was of particular interest to us because it allowed the, in the increased multiplexing rate of sixplex from fourplex. And as, and as those of us in the biomarker world know, the ideas of multiplexing and the ability to complete these in a, in a reliable fashion is becoming more and more prominent. And is definitely something that we are interested in looking further into LGC. The next two really cover the same thing, as I mentioned in the previous slide, the temperature controlled reagent assay chambers allow for more precision in the accuracy, uh, more reagent stability. Uh, this improves your CVs throughout the assays. And in turn, this improves the throughput that you'll be able to run and lower down the cost per sample as there'll be lower needs for repeats and failures. As mentioned in the technology overview flowchart slide, the magnetic assisted bead Odin is a huge improvement to its predecessor, the HD1. Uh, the higher bead fill provides a path for increased assay sensitivity. How it does this is with the HD1, the beads would be put on in a gravity fed system. The oil would push the beads into the wells. Obviously this isn't a, the most efficient system and would allow for many of the beads to be missed from the wells. Now what we have is a magnetic plate underneath this system, which pulls down the paramagnetic bead, as well as the gravity feeding option of the, the oil seal. As you'll see in some data slides later on, this has definitely made a big improvement to this part of the technology and this part of the instrument. And with more beads, we're going to get more sensitivity or higher sensitivity, I should say, with less cases of bead dropouts and lower in the cases of repeat assays needed. Now, one thing that was also very important for us being in a regulated environment was its compatibility with Windows 10, and more importantly, its compatibility with 21 CFR Part 11 compliant. And for those who don't know or have not heard of the 21 CFR Part 11 regulations, these are FDA regulations on electronic records and electronic signatures, audit trails, and everything really you'd need to run clinical samples in a regulated environment. So really it acts as a sort of integrity check for the, for the work we carry out at LGC. So before we went ahead and purchased the HDX, we wanted to do some thorough research in the, the cross-platform comparison between the HD1 and the HDX, as we'd heard that the HD1 did have some downfalls. But when it did work, it was a, a very good machine and we wanted to make sure that 
the HTX could perform as well, if not even better, when it comes to analyzing biomarkers. So to do so, Victor Liban from the Department of Neurochemistry in Gothenburg University, Sweden, very kindly allowed us to present on some of his data. Comparing neurofilament light or NFL data run on both the HD1 and the HDX. I'll talk more on NFL later and LGC's in-house validation of this biomarker, as it is one of Quanteric's most prominent and stable markers, and is becoming more and more apparent that it is needed in the biomarker world. But really what we can see here is that for this plasma generated curves, the only real difference is the number of beads. Everything else is very comparable. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, the, the more beads we have, the greater this machine will be for us, the greater this platform will be for us. And we can see we get an increase of around one and a half thousand bead counts, which is very promising to see. And is something that Victor himself, who is a very experienced user of Quanteric's instruments, has seen throughout his assays as well. Not only has the number of beads increased, the number of beads per array CV has actually decreased, which just shows that the, the magnetic bead loading system is much more efficient than it, the previous gravity fed system was. And this slide really just shows the same thing again, completely comparable spike recovery QC samples with a quite a large increase of just under one and a half thousand average number of beads between the HDX and the HD1. And again, similar to the CV reduction, this time we see a much, much reduced dropout frequency with the HDX samples. And I feel like it's worth noting at this point as well that the CV values we do see are between five and eight percent are really, really pleasing figures to see as this is something that we've been struggling to reach in our ultra sensitive work in the past. And of course, we all know that with tighter CVs, we can have more trust in the reliability of our data sets. So after having a look at some of Victor's data, we wanted to test in-house ourselves um, some of the parameters that we might be looking at for in-house validations. And in order to do this, we ran one of the NFL kits that we were supplied as part of our training. We ran this in both serum and plasma. We wanted to run three replicates versus one replicate of each standard or each plasma and serum individual in this case, just to see if the results we got were comparable and that we could, if the sponsor or client requested, run samples in single analysis, therefore increasing the throughput, faster project turnaround, lower costs, and less analyst time spent in the labs. And the data here really speaks for itself. All the CVs we saw for these triplicate measurements were less than 10%. The mean accuracy between all the points was way within 20% for most of them. And from the start of the preparation of this assay to being able to export the data was around two and a half hours. So a big, big improvement on the workflow side of things. And this, this is something that we've definitely been wanting to improve on from what was our current uh, or existing ultra sensitive detection system. Now I'm not going to go too in depth for this slide, but as we don't have the HD1 or have never had the HD1 on site, we are unable to directly compare some of these new features on the HDX. So we got some feedback back, feedback from Victor and have tabulated them here. Just to summarize for the temperature controls, he is yet to see any benefit in the data. Of course, this doesn't mean this is a bad thing. It's just perhaps saying that he hasn't had any stability issues or reproducibility issues with the instrument to date. The magnet, as I've already mentioned, we have seen increased bead fill, increased bead fill precision. Uh, this is both us and Victor. Neither of us have had any major instrument issues. We had an initial issue at the start, but this was resolved very quickly with no further issues. From what we've been told, the transition from the HD1 to the HDX has been very smooth with no issues. The onboard, the onboard barcode reader was convenient, but it's we both prefer the use of the handheld reader. This is a completely user-based experience though, and every user will have their own preference to this. Although we haven't tested any clinical samples yet, uh, we've been told it's a good tool for troubleshooting and result security. One thing we haven't had is any issues with it 
um, reading low levels of liquid in the reagents or in the samples. We've never had an issue of there is no, not enough sample present as the machine will always tell you before you go to set up a run or go to start a run if it has enough reagent or sample to complete the test. And in terms of other improvements, a lot of the regulated account management reporting, traceability, audit trails, calibrations, maintenance, because Victor works in a university lab, this really isn't crucial for him. So this is where we were able to step in and add our column to the table, if you like. Uh, so the CSV process was complicated as when we filled out this table, it was still in the process of being completed. It now is. Um, this took two to three months and was really, you could tell it was Quantarix's first insight into the regulated world. But as mentioned, we are now there and we are in a fully regulated state, ready to run PD and PK samples. As for the calibration and maintenance of the instrument, the maintenance itself is very straightforward. It takes two clicks of a button, 20 minutes, start and end of day, procedures are in place. Uh, as for the calibrations, these were a bit more tricky to the start. The calibrations run on something called an SQT or a Samoa qualification test. And we have found when running these that best practice is an absolute must. So we've now adopted the approach of uh, wearing two sets of gloves, wiping each set of gloves down with alcohol, and where possible running these samples using a female analyst, as bizarre as that sounds. This is due to the analyte present in the SQT samples being predominantly found in male individuals. Although we did have initial issues with these, uh, Quantarix have been very helpful with us and um, outlining some best practices we can take, as I've just mentioned. And since then, we've seen passing SQTs fairly regularly. Now onto the next slide. And this is where the, the data comes into it. This is where myself and two other analysts perform basic training given by Quanterix over two to three days. Uh, the training covered complete start, start the instrument, end the instrument, all the procedures necessary, how to set up a run, how to set up the different types of kits, the advantage kits and the discovery kits. And we were all able to run our own PSA test kit or prostate specific antigen test kit with some high and low controls to see the robustness between each individual analyst. Now, as you can see, with only a few hours training, all the analysts managed to perform basically identically. Uh, I'm not too ashamed to say that analyst two is myself. Uh, this was identified to be, as I said in the previous slide, uh, the PSA levels as I was the only male present during the training. This has since been run again using the best practices that I mentioned, and this curve has uh, flattened out a lot better at the bottom. And I think something that's important to note here is that when dealing with these levels of accuracy and when you go into the, the sub picogram per mil levels, it's normally a very difficult training procedure. The workflow we have in place for the single X arena system at the moment can take quite a long time to train up an individual to where they are competent to run the assays. This really showed us that this platform can improve on this significantly as to get to the point to run these assays, these PSA assays, it did quite literally take two to three hours of training with the, with the instrument itself and the Guanterix field application specialist. And in completing these PSA test runs for the, the kits they provided, it, it made us even more keen to get, to get our hands on the homebrew development module that they offered as part of the training. And this is what I'll be covering in the next few slides. Now the method development side of this, or the homebrew as Quanterix call it, is something that really appealed to us. And I think there's gonna be a benefit to us and our sponsors, as it allows us to take almost any analyte and create a bespoke assay around that biomarker or analyte within the ultra sensitivity of the instrument as we know it. So there is a fairly, fairly simple workflow to follow when performing your own method development on the Samoa. The first step is to evaluate antibody pairs and calibrators. Now this can take quite some time on the HDX as we found out. And from researching some of the literature, speaking to Victor Liman, who I mentioned earlier, um, it was found that you could screen antibody pairs using the Luminex MagPix, which we do also have two of on site. And we could complete the bead preparation using the Kingfisher Flex, which we also have in our small molecules department. 
After this step is done and you've prepared your bead using the EDC or sulfur NHS methods that I'll just talk about in the next slide, and you've biotinylated your detection antibody, <clears throat> the next step is to set up your assay definition, as they call it, on the instrument itself. And what this does is talks about the, or defines the cadences or the incubation times, the wash steps, if you're going to be running a one step, a two step or a three step assay format. It allows you to run more than one bead preparation, more than one detector preparation, whether you want to try different PEG4, PEG12, um, double long chains, any of those sort of itinillation methods, you're able to perform much more checkerboard style experiments all within one assay, which is a really, really good use for us here at LGC and can, what, and can make what is quite a laborious process normally very quick, very swift and very efficient. After you have some semblance of a working assay, you can then do some of the more optimization steps. So your detector and SBG or the enzyme titration, you can look at optimizing your buffers. Uh, Quantarix have their range of buffers that you can try in these. I think range from A to E, sample buffer. Uh, you can look at increasing your sample volume. You can look at the inclusion of helper beads, which are just non-functional beads. Uh, Quantarix have their own technical note on this. That can be found on our website. This is something that we're looking to try in one of our current homebrew assays, but as, as yet we have not tried. But we are looking forward to seeing the results on this when we do so. I think what has become apparent to us during the training and during the homebrew developments that we have going on is that this really can be a very quick way to develop a method or just to have a look-see to see if this is a feasible method, if this is a feasible biomarker that can be run on this instrument. There's really no drawn out processes, no seven, eight hour workflows, no laborious hand washing or plate reading steps. So to put this to the test, we wanted in the training to try one of our more tricky assays that is currently residing on the Singlex Arena platform. So for confidentiality reasons, I'll be referring to this as Analyte X for the rest of these slides. As previously mentioned, it is currently residing as an ARENA method, as a regulated project, and has the potential to go on for a number of years, which is why we'd like to look at moving this across to the HDX platform. So to start, we conjugated the capture antibody to the Samoa beads, the Samoa paramagnetic beads that are supplied within the homebrew development kits. The detection monoclonal antibody was biotinylated following the Quantarix protocol. This was something that we looked to change in the later slides. And to ensure our label efficiency was good or if something did go wrong, we might have an idea of understanding what went wrong. We labeled a positive control PSA uh, antibody in parallel to this study or to this training, sorry. And what we saw was a very low bead conjugation efficiency with the capture antibody. I believe we saw around the 12% mark. Um, the PSA we saw around 80% and ideally Quantarix would like to see between the 85 to 95% conjugation efficiencies. So we knew that running this assay uh, straight off would be quite risky and we probably wouldn't get much, much data from it. And as you can see from experiment one, we used a three-step method using all default standard conditions uh, we were correct. We did not see really any good signal to go off. If you look at the top signal of Analyte X, you see it's around 0.2 AEB. AEB standing for average enzymes per bead and is the raw signal for this uh, platform. Quantarix say that a successful homebrew training, you should be looking at between the, the 10 to 15 uh, range for your top signal of AEB, and this should produce a nice a nice curve going all the way down. So we knew something had to change here and we knew this probably wasn't going to get us anywhere uh, with this with this marker. It's worth saying at this point that we knew this marker might cause some issues. It has not been a particularly easy uh, biomarker to work with in the past. So this really wasn't that unexpected for us. So going into the next experiments, we didn't really want to change too much, but we did just want to change the format of the assay. So instead of running a three step, we run a two step. And this is simply where our detector 
is incubated within the sample and capture, unlike a three-step method in which the detector is added afterwards, after its separate incubations and wash periods. Now, although as you can see, this still hasn't produced a, a massive improvement on the top signal to where we'd want it to be, it has significantly increased it from where it was to around the 0 0.1 to the, the one AEB values. And this just shows that with a simple, a really simple change, and this really is just one click of a button on the assay definition setup, you can make quite a large improvement in your assay. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a case where you have to go back and label all the time and then recomplete another seven, eight hour assay because you're really unsure of where you are. The benefit of this platform is it allows you to complete one of these assays with a 10 minute setup. And for these assays, it was around a one hour runtime. So you can get quite a lot of development work done within a very short amount of time. So of experiment three, although we were fairly sure at this point that we were going to have to relabel um, because our, our average enzymes for VEB was still very low, still nowhere near where we needed it to be. We did just want to run a very quick test on two concentrations of the, the enzyme SBG. This was at 250 nanomoles and the standard 150 nanomoles. And again, as you can see, a very little increase, but really not where we want to be within, with, the, with this particular assay. But at the same time, very assuring or very, very assuring, I should say that we believe we can get somewhere with, asset, with this assay. And it's only taken us perhaps two to three hours at this point to figure this out and to get to these three experiments complete stage. So for the next experiment, or before we completed the next experiment, it was decided that we should relabel. Now the homebrew training consists of labeling the beads using an EDC method, which can be quite time consuming and Quanteris did say there were other methods that could be available that they were working on at the time, which have since been published. And this was the combined method of EDC and sulfur NHS linkers. The reason sulfur NHS is often included in EDC coupling protocols is to improve the efficiency of the conjugation methods. The EDC couples NHS to carboxyls, forming an NHS ester that is considerably more stable than when it is just the EDC by itself. And this allows for a more efficient conjugation to the primary amines at normal pH levels. You will have to forgive some of my chemistry knowledge there. I am definitely a much better biologist than I am a chemist, that's for sure. But in practical terms, this was adopted with the aim to use less antibody and yield a higher top signal. We also biotinylated the detectors uh, using three different types of biotin this time. We used PEG4, PEG12 and double long chain. This was a completely standard biotinylation process with no additional or unique steps added at any point. So we saw with this method that we did improve the labeling efficiency. We saw actually a double, a doubling increase in this to around the 25% from 12% with the pure EDC method. This is obviously still not where we'd like to be. We'd like to be at around the 80% mark, as you can see the PSA control is. But it definitely gave us enough to go on for the next experiments in which we just run them under the standard two step that we determined was better than the three step in the previous slides. From this experiment, you can see that there is quite a good jump from the original signals we saw in experiment three. We now see at the PEG-12 detection, we see around the four AEB mark. While this is still low, this does form the start of what could be a promising and good assay. And this definitely gave us a clear idea of where we should go next with this. So. We had the ideas of titrating the detection antibody further, uh, increasing the SBG concentration, and to investigate the use of helper beads, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, this would be to improve the signal to noise at the lower end. One thing we did decide from this experiment though was that we would move forward using the PEG-12 and PEG-4 biotinylated detector antibodies as the double long chain seemed to, seemed to produce uh, two low results. And we were confident after just the one experiment that the PEG-12 would look like the most promising way forward for us. So next we ran a total of eight homebrew tests. We ran PEG-4 and PEG-12 both at four different detector titrations from 0.14 to 0.71 micrograms per mil in assay concentration. 
it's definitely produced results that we were hoping for with regards to the higher end. We saw an increase in the top signal, but what this did mean was that we saw a reduction in the signal to noise uh, at the lower end of the assay. Now our current residing Arena method has a uh, LLOQ of 1.6 picograms per mil. So in order to properly transfer this method, this would be the, the range that we're trying to hit. And we also we always like to get a signal to noise of at least around the free mark, uh, ideally more than this, for there to be enough differentiation in the background that you can trust your lower end samples. As these tables show that PEG12 clearly does this with around the 3.4, 3.6 and 2.7 uh, signal to noise at the 1.6 picogram per mil level. And with an increase in high signal, we get to the 4.7 mark which is getting closer and closer to where we'd want to be. And again, to reiterate at this stage that this was on our second day of training, I believe, and this is after maybe three to four, maybe five hours in the lab total. And we already have several sets of data over five experiments, four or five experiments, testing a range of different detector uh, conjugations, titration methods, uh, assay format methods, and it just really allowed us as analysts to have that confidence to go forward with these method developments and not worry so much that after an eight hour day, you could end up with uh, no results or bad results. Because with this, it really doesn't matter that much. You know, you can just run again within the, the hour or so. And you can also see just comparing from the first slide of this um, method development overview that I'm showing, the graph from this one to the first one the first one was almost a complete flat line with really no no hope for that particular assay setup. And here we see the, the makings of a, of a nice looking curve shape. That spans a very good range for sample analysis projects. So with that said, we didn't just want to stop there. Our suggested next step with the help of the Quanterix field application specialist was to increase the enzyme or the SBG concentration uh, at the higher levels of detection. Uh, as shown in this this assay or this experiment. It was also decided that for the following experiments, we would just stick to the PEG-12 uh, biotinylation detector or biotinylated detector, I should say, sorry, as this is showing the most promise in the previous two experiments. And here's the results of that experiment. As you can see, this really gave us the results that we were hoping for. With the increased enzyme concentration, we saw a nice separation between the bottom standards and the signal to noise at the 1.6 picogram level, like we were aiming for, of around three. We also saw a large increase in the top signal AEB from the previous experiment, which was at 4.69. We now are at 5.86. And this is now really when we're in the realms of, this is a good assay, we can do something with this. And with a few more tweaks, we can start to work on the the more crucial parameters for this particular project in order for it, for it to be a successful transfer. The details of which, unfortunately, I can't go into in too much depth for this uh, webinar presentation. And this was where our training came to an end, if you like. Uh, this is where we have stopped the development for now. We have some next steps to be completed in the coming days and weeks, and this includes the addition of the helper beads, as I mentioned, and the proprietary diluents supplied by uh, Quanterix themselves. They have been very useful in discussing this data with us, going through the next steps with both us and the sponsor um, in order to successfully transfer this method across. And this is definitely something we look forward to improving further on in the coming weeks. If you'd like any further information on this method development, please feel free to contact myself or Richard Hughes, whose details will be at the, on the last slide, and we'll be happy to give you some more information on this. So this is just a, a final slide on the method development side of things on where we are with the Quanterix after a few days and where we are with the single X method after really a few months. Really, there's no debate in which has been the simpler uh, platform to run this assay on. The development time has been days to weeks compared to weeks to months. 
the assay prep time, as I've mentioned in the previous slides, has been less than one hour. And the single X platform we have runs on a six to seven hour workflow. The potential sample throughput for the Quanterix HDX would be around 288 samples per run in a single look at multi plate run. And while this is a similar um, sample throughput to the single X in one run, 288 samples, this would take much longer. The read time alone would take around 12 hours on this instrument and would definitely require the use of more than one analyst. The workflow diagram at the bottom just shows where we were able to get to in the short training time that we had with Quanterix on site. And after this time, we definitely felt confident that we could go forward with uh, future assay development projects and optimizing this assay even further by ourselves uh, with no real difficulty in setting up the instruments or instrument, I should say. So at the risk of repeating myself, I've just prepared a last slide on this development that really summarizes and overviews uh, the process that we've been through and some of our collected thoughts as we went through this process. As mentioned, all data for this assay was collected in around the three, day, three days mark with less than three hours lab and prep time combined. Uh, we went from no signal, no top, no top signal, flat curve shape, uh, to within a working assay that can be definitely built on in a couple of days. The methods are straightforward to develop and to troubleshoot. As mentioned at the start, the labeling procedure can be lengthy and screening pairs could be very time consuming of both time and materials and reagents. There are ways around this, as I mentioned, with the MagPix systems and the Kingfisher uh, flex systems that we have on site. It was also obvious to us that the sulfur sulfur NHS EDC combined method was definitely the way that we'll probably look look to do assay developments in future and conjugations. The real pleasing aspect of this whole training sessions for us and this development project for us was to see how easy the instrument can homebrew and allow the several condition testing of various conjugates and titrations in the one experiment or the two experiments. It was noted that all of our analysts that use this instrument and have since used this instrument have spoken on how easy the machine is to get to use and to get to know from an analyst point of view. And this again is something that's really beneficial for us because it means the training time will be reduced. We are able to get many more analysts at all levels trained on this instrument, meaning the throughput that we can allow on this instrument is at a much higher level. And the instrument itself will always be looked after to a exceptionally high standard due to the sheer amount of people that we are able to train on it. And one last point, the, the various tech notes as I've mentioned with the helper beads, etc. Um, the technical support has been exceptional up to this point and Quanterix have been really helpful in getting us uh, set up with methods and on future methods. I know they're always willing to make calls with us to get us going with the strongest possible start. And with that being said, uh, that is the last of my method development slides. For the last uh, remaining two or three slides, I'd like to go over some of the regulated work that we here at Fordham have been working on with this platform, and that is the validation of neurofilament light, or NFL. Neurofilament light is a very prominent biomarker in neurological disorders, such as Huntington's, uh, Alzheimer's, dementia, etc., and it directly reflects axonal damage, and is therefore present in high levels in CSF, or cerebrospinal fluid. Whilst there is high levels in CSF, this is not the, the preferred way, definitely for the patient's sake, to test this biomarker, as the process to remove this matrix can be quite invasive or is quite invasive, which is why several studies have been completed on serum and plasma levels of CSF, as this can be taken by a simple blood test. So LGC have successfully completed the validation of NFL in healthy serum and plasma. The validation itself took nine days, pending long-term stability at one year. To give a brief overview of the parameters that we assessed and the outcomes, we ran six PNAs using three different analysts. Uh, this was really to enforce the robustness of the method. Uh, with the previous systems that we use for ultrasensitivity, one thing that we really struggled with is getting these levels of tight precision 
across different analysts, across different days, and across, of course, the different QC levels. So we were really pleased to see that we got an average precision, inter-athlete precision of around the 5% mark, which is quite significantly improved on previous methods. We completed a standard curve and weighting assessment using our goodness of fit software. Uh, this is a statistical assessment and we ran it on the six PNA batches just mentioned and it was concluded that a five parameter logistic fit with a one over Y squared weighting was the optimal fit for this assay or the optimal regression for this assay, I should say. The next two parameters were arguably two of the most important that we had to test. Uh, this was a suitability for single cut assessment and the multi-plate analysis. Now the single cut assessment, this just will allow us, because it is an analyzer, we would have the option to validate running in single cut instead of duplicate or triplicate. This in turn could both save time and money for the sponsors. And the results of this were very much as we expected. The single cut analysis looked identical or very comparable to the measurements we took in duplicate. And these were assessed in endogenous only QC samples. The multi-plate stability test allows us to run the instrument at full capacity. With it being a high throughput machine with the capability to run 288 samples in one experiment, this does take around five and a half hours. So we couldn't go forward with this without validating how reproducible our samples would be at the beginning of the run to the samples at the end of the run. And we are pleased to say that for both serum and plasma, we can run at full capacity across the validated range within this assay. The kit lot to lot variation is quite a hot topic in the biomarker world at the moment. And to complete this, we ran QCs on the established kit lot that we completed the validation on and then two individual kit lots that we purchased separately. Overall, this performed very well, although minimal bridging would be required. It's worth saying that we would always bridge regardless for a biomarker study, even if the lot-to-lot -lot assessment looked extremely comparable throughout the entire validated range. And this is simply because you just don't know how a kit will change lot-to-lot. -lot. The two kits we have performed very well. Um, a third kit we purchased may not. So this is something we would always approach during a biomarker study. We saw acceptable results when it comes to six freeze four cycles and two hour room temperature stability samples. Uh, the room temperature stability will be extended to 24 hours in the coming days. For matrix effects or selectivity, we tested hemolyzed and lipemic samples, and there was no evidence of matrix effects from the endogenous QCs that we tested at the expected sample concentrations. And perhaps the most well-known and important parameter we have for a typical biomarker study would be parallelism. And this is really just a test of, is the biomarker behaving how we would expect it to behave when being subject to dilutions? Now, as is the challenge with all biomarkers, to run a successful parallelism study, you first need high endogenous levels. Ideally, you would have high enough endogenous levels to dilute into the range of the curve. For this study or this validation, this was not the case. Unfortunately, as NFL is very low levels in serum and plasma or healthy serum and plasma. But we were able to get some endogenous levels that we could dilute down. And we managed to, inclusive of the MRD, get down to an eightfold parallelism which will more than cover, or we expect will more than cover, the range of disease state samples that we may expect to analyze. Of course, this is something that can be looked into further when we do get incurred samples from uh, disease state studies or projects, and we will be able to update the validation when this is the case. As mentioned, we have long-term stability pending for up to one year. This is to be tested at the three month interval, six month interval, and the one year interval at both minus 80 and minus 20 degrees. And we do have the potential to add the additional disease state and CSF validation onto this. So we are ready to cater for any uh, sponsor or client needs. In terms of next steps we have at LGC for the HDX, 
we have been talking about an in-house validation of Contarix's first cytokine sixplex panel. We are looking to AB40, AB42, and alpha synuclein feasibility and qualifications. Again, we've come to understand that the neuromarkers are really prominent at the moment in the biomarker world. And there is a lot of research being completed on these. So the larger we can expand our menu to be on the HDX, the more help we can be to our sponsors. We also have various homebrew projects on the way. Uh, as mentioned in the, this slide set, the project that we currently have residing on the Rena system. This is a current work in live project. Uh, we've also begun one more project in the last week, which we are looking forward to developing more on. And in terms of the instrument itself and the hardware, we are in talks to get it fully integrated in terms of plumbing and the waste disposal system. Uh, this will further improve the automation on the platform as currently the system relies on the user filling up the water containers and emptying the waste containers periodically. So overall, we're really impressed with the system so far and LGC's investment into the HDX platform offers sponsors quick and efficient turnaround on ultra-sensitivity biomarker projects with increased reproducibility and precision. We are really looking forward to seeing where this platform takes us as a CRO. And we definitely look forward to seeing how we can help to push more and more therapeutics to market. So with that being said, I'd like to thank you all for listening. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact myself or Richard with the details written on the screen now. Thanks again and goodbye.